Imagine how much force is required to deflect this. The more springs you add, the harder it is. These are in parallel, and so their effective spring constants add. So if, let's just make up some numbers to make the math easy, but to illustrate this. Let's say that one of these springs requires 100 pounds to pull a distance of one foot. I'm just making it up, obviously, that's more than a foot. Just, we'll keep the numbers easy, okay? 100 pounds to pull at one foot. If you put two springs side by side, how much force is going to be required to pull that to one foot? 200 pounds, right? So the spring constant, force versus deflection, that's all it really is, has just doubled, right? So you can see why you've got to have a, a motor that's geared down to apply the extreme large amount of force and understand what this thing needs is to store energy. And the way they're doing this, they, now storing energy is great, but you also want to make sure that there's a very high force. Why would you want this to output extremely high force? Acceleration. To have high acceleration, the force is proportional to the acceleration. You've got a decent amount of mass here that has to be accelerated. How many people are going to pay the twenty or fifty dollars, however much they cost for these darn things, to uh, take a gentle ride into the air and then bounce a little bit and come back? Nobody, right? Everybody wants to feel like this is a rocket taking off, so that requires a lot of force. And so the springs are placed in uh, parallel with each other and not in series. So we'll watch and go flying, but you see the upper plate reach the top and stop between the marks apparently. There's a pause and of course, eventually, they go flying. And one thing you may have noticed back here is that I move forward one frame at a time. You notice as they're going up, the reason they're going up is because this lower plate is moving up. So there's an example of some springs in parallel with one another. <clears throat> Coil springs come in several different flavors of end treatment. You can just have plain ends where you basically have a, a coiled wire that's cut at either end. There's also squared or closed ends where the end coils are bent over so that they frequently touch the preceding coil. So basically one whole coil is a dead coil. It doesn't participate in the spring action because this coil is already touching. That gives you somewhat of a, a flatter end than this does in order to support the spring and apply force to it uh, and prevent it from, from rotating out, uh, out from along the line. There are also squared and ground ends where not only are the ends squared off, so they're touching, but they're also ground off. Now, if you've ever rebuilt an engine, you've probably seen these on the, um, the valve springs, right? The valve springs are always squared and ground uh, because you want the ends to be flat and not to, to turn. Um, there are plain ends like this that are also ground, and again, these are not common for valve springs, mainly because there's a gap that remains here, and so this last spring is in, or this last coil is involved in the spring action. As you deflect the spring, the end coil also deflects. These are not very common because that end coil ends up being fairly weak. It has a smaller cross section. It seems like that would help the spring buckle, not having a full diameter touching whatever it's seated on. Right. Well, that's sort of the case here too, because this doesn't have a full diameter that it's seated on. Uh, I think this is probably one of the most common. If you're going to do anything, this is either this or this are the most common from what I've seen. But you're right, the buckling is something very important. So there's a couple of terms that we need, and I'm sorry the scan is such low quality here. You might want to look in the book for this. By the way, we're in chapter 18. That's the spring chapter. I know we're jumping around in the book. I do not go through the book one chapter after another because I'm trying to give you information about the page, page 599 information about machine elements that will, will be useful to you in your project in the order that you're likely to need them okay so uh, everybody needs fasteners that's why I start with fasteners and frames but I'm trying to go through this in a, an order that will help you with your project anyway so chapter 18 page 599 you can see the image there a little bit better. I should probably rescan it. I don't know why I have it yet. <clears throat> when the spring has no force in it, the length of the spring is called the free length, and it's given the subscript F. So L sub F is the free length of the spring. 
Now, most times when a spring is installed in the machine it's supposed to work in, it's already compressed a little bit. And so that is called L sub I, the install length of the spring. So there's already some initial force on the spring in the installed position. The operating length is the, the position that the spring is supposed to go to, down to at maximum in order to operate in, in everyday use. So if you think about a valve uh, on an engine, the valve, when, when you put the spring on, you have to compress it to put the upper piece on. I can't remember what it's called right now, but you typically use a spring compressor to do that because they're fairly stiff springs. Um, or you, you use your hands and some screwdrivers and things and swear a little bit and you get it done anyway. Right? So anyway, when the valve is all the way open and the camshaft has pushed the valve all the way down, that's the so-called operating length. That's the length that the spring's supposed to go to at maximum during normal operation. But then finally, and so that's LO, finally there's the so-called solid length, and I think uh, Ms. Becker alluded to this when she was talking about the coil clearance, and the farthest you would ever want the spring to go. And once the, once the coils are touching one another, the spring constant changes drastically, right? Then it's a nonlinear spring. Now what you're trying to do is compress metal. That's what these are usually made of. And so you don't want to go. Now it's possible that you will end up here, so as a spring designer you have to consider this configuration. <coughs> but most of the time you don't intend for it to ever go to that, that position. So the key things we've got F for free length, I for installed length, O for operating, and S for solid length. Okay, so there's L sub all those different letters. Now if you think about the spring itself and its geometry, the wire diameter is pretty obvious, but there's an inner diameter and an outer diameter, and then a so-called mean or average diameter, which is at the center of the wire. And so I, D, O, D, and D sub M, the mean diameter, will be parameters we really care about. Don't worry too much about what this chart means right now. This just has to do with, it's just a couple of equations that are conveniently put all in one slide so that you've got them together. I don't think your author even has this in the book. I put it in here for you and I made it so you would have it. You can just print this out and put it in your book if you want. So just print out this one page. And I'll show you how to use it in the context of example problems. But it's just a bunch of different parameters that are useful depending on the end treatment of the spring. Now, the first thing that you probably haven't thought of when it comes to springs is the spring index. The spring index is the ratio of the main diameter of the spring, remember the main diameter of the spring, to the diameter of the wire. So this kind of tells you how much like a slinky it is versus how short and fat it is. Okay? That's what this is telling you. Now typically you want a spring index greater than five. So this is not in your book, but I drew these in SolidWorks so that you could visually see a spring with an index of five, a spring with an index of 12. This is the range you want to stay in. Most of the time we start with a spring index of about seven for design. But as long as you're between five and 12, it should be an acceptable machine or a spring. If the spring index drops below five, you end up with a very large diameter of wire being bent very tightly and you cause a lot of stress and a lot of problems in the spring. Uh, if you try to make a spring with too high a spring index, you end up with something that's too flimsy and, and can't really support much load. Yes? Whenever I did camshaft work, like over the uh, break, mm -hmm. the new valve springs that I bought were double valve springs. So on the, on the outer one, it was like a higher, it was like a higher C number. It, I think it was like nine or 10 is what it said like on the spec. And then the inner one was lower. It was like, I believe seven, okay. something like that. And that was just that way because the camshaft I got was high lift and short duration. So okay. whenever you have that high lift and short duration, that inner spring acts at like higher tension. So that way whenever the valve has to go back down or like come back up, it can, it has enough force to, to you know, keep in contact with the cam load. Okay. So Interesting. It goes back to that what we were saying earlier about the I don't know, I, something earlier made me think about the double springs, yeah, and this yeah. is kind of direct. Yeah, that. thank you, thank you for sharing that. It's interesting that they gave you the spring index. Yeah, it, it, really was, it was on the box, and there was so much technical data on that box. Like, yeah. I don't know why Texas Speed is giving away their information like this. But. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> well, you can measure the spring and see what it is. It's not too difficult to measure its geometry. Um, so anything too low you don't want because you really have to bend the wire too much. And then a too high spring index in the spring is just not worth much. Or very 
There are other types of springs, and I think this might uh, help you. We're going to start talking about stresses in helical springs. And I thought I'd show you this. Anybody recognize what this might be? Could be a Dr. Durango. Could be the the uh, the uh, uh, Toyota pickup I had at one time. Yeah, yeah, they used them too. And it was a '92 Ford, uh, not Ford, '92 Toyota pickup, and it had a torsion bar for each of the front wheels. Uh, there was no spring on the A-arm, and so you guys that know cars would know this, but for those of you that don't, this is a shock absorber. It resists motion, whereas this is serving as the spring to actually push the wheel into the ground and keep it away from the, the frame. If you think about a vehicle's frame, the wheel is suspended beneath the frame, right? The wheel has to move relative to the frame so that your car doesn't follow every single pothole, right? And so the way you do that is you put a spring between the two. The problem with the spring is that the wheel will just move up and down indefinitely. Once it starts moving, you'll just keep bouncing. Okay? You can tell when a car's shock absorbers or dampers are broken, all you got to do is push on the bumper and watch it bounce. If it just keeps bouncing for a while, your shock absorbers are broken. On the other hand, if the car is sitting way back, right, like a boat, and that means your rear springs are shocked because they're not pushing the wheels away from the vehicle uh, with adequate force. They can't anymore. So Toyota did something a little bit different. I guess maybe Dodge Durango did as well, where instead of taking a wire and bending that wire around, they just left it straight. That's what this torsion bar is. And that's how you should think about a helical wire and spring, at least one that is a compression or an extension spring. Now the way this works is that this torsion bar actually was pre-stressed. It would have been stressed, would have been turned this way and attached to the frame so that it can't rotate on this end. And the other end was not allowed to rotate in the control arm. The control arm had to, to rotate. So there'd be a pivot point back here. And then this is a providing a torque to the control arm. And so what would happen is that as the, the vehicle went over bumps and this went up, well, that would increase the torsional stress in the bar and generate a spring action. So this is just like what we studied in strength of materials where we just had a simple round bar. Remember, we put lines on it and we twisted it to see how it would deflect. That's exactly what we're talking about here. And that's, as I said, the way you should think about a helical spring that's been coiled is as a torsion bar that just doesn't take up as much space because it's been bent around a mantle. Okay. Now one interesting thing about this, because of the way that the spring has been wound around the mandrel, it turns out that the stress is no longer uniform. In this torsion bar you have uniform stress. Okay, it's no problem. The, the stress is maximum at the outer surface, goes to zero in the center as we learned in strength of materials. But when you take this and you wrap it around a mandrel, so you have a, a spring that's a compression spring, then it turns out that you end up with a non-uniform stress distribution across the cross section. And what ends up happening is the interior surface of the spring has the highest stress. So if you ever see a, a spring like that start to fail, it will start to fail most likely, unless it's been, been damaged on the outside, it will start to fail on the inside surface. It makes it a little bit more difficult to, uh, to detect. But that's where the maximum shear stress occurs. And by the way, that is the type of stress in a torsion bar is a shear stress, right? Because you're, you're putting torque on it. That's the same kind of stress that a compression spring experiences as well is a torsion. And it makes sense if you think about it. Imagine the, the spring, imagine unrolling it and, and flattening it out in the same sense. You're, you're just torquing the bar is all you're really doing. Now this is the equation that we're going to use forward, backward, and never which way. We're going to rearrange this time and again. But it basically allows us to relate the shear stress within the spring to the wire diameter, the mean diameter of the spring, the uh, wall correction factor, which by the way, this is for geometry, okay, this is for the fact that we've wrapped a piece of wire around a mandrel, so it's no longer just a plain bar. You know what, we should find this equation, because you really need to mark it. It's a really important equation, and like I said, we'll rearrange it several different ways. Here it is. It's equation 18.4 on page 604. So this is an equation well worth highlighting, maybe even marking the page. They, your author gives us this equation several different times later on in the, the text, and I'll ex describe to you when we're seeing the same thing again. Uh, but it's, it's uh, an equation we use all over the place. I forgot one term, the, the force F. 
So that's the force being applied to the spring, and there's the stress. Obviously, if there's no force, there's no stress. So the stress is just proportional to the force. It's still a linear spring. Okay? Any questions? Any questions about this? So far? Well, I thought I'd uh, show you. We've only got a few things left. I want to show you uh, a video. A couple of them, in fact. But what I'll do is I'll show you one or two, and then we'll go back into uh, okay. go back into the lecture material. One more slide or so. Different types of springs include compression on the right and extension on the left. During use, these torsion springs will twist at one or both ends. The workers start with rolls of steel cord. The cord diameters range in size depending on the type of springs being made. A machine called a derailleur unwinds the roll, feeding it to a computer-guided forming machine. This forming machine forces the cord through a channel, shapes it into a coil, and then cuts it into segments. Small wheels and a metal shaft guide the cord into shape. These are torsion springs for use in the automotive industry, which relies heavily on a variety of springs. The average car, for example, has about 350 of them. A cone-shaped yellow sensor detects the correct angle of each spring. A good reading is required, so the machine can move the next spring forward through the channel to be formed. This machine can produce up to 2,000 springs per hour, depending on their size. Here, another larger forming machine creates extension springs that are nearly 16 centimeters long. A mechanical arm grabs the coil and chops it into segments after it's formed in a channel. As the coil emerges, another mechanical arm steadies it to prevent it from vibrating. This keeps the spring's tension constant, enabling the machine to produce at top speed. In slow motion, you can see how the machine grabs the coil's first ring and bends it to form a hook. This all takes place as the coil emerges from the channel. A vise then secures the last ring on the end of the coil, while another arm twists it to make the spring's other hook. Slowed down, you see how two arms surround the coil being held in the vise. One arm then grabs the last ring, while the other arm twists it upward. This machine makes compression springs, a model with tapered ends that's often used in seat belts. A metal probe detects the correct length of the springs after they're formed. The machine has four rotary shafts called cams. A computer ensures each spring has the desired specs. The springs are also heated to relax the metal. This gives them the ability to retain their shape after flexing. Another machine creates longer, thicker torsion springs. It shapes the cord into a coil with a shaft and then passes it over a tube to steady it. This ensures the spring will have the required tension. Springs can be as thin as human hair or as thick as a broom handle. Train wheels, for instance, include some of the industry's thickest compression springs. This machine makes another type of spring, often called wire forms. They're flexible steel cords curved or bent at an angle. These ones, shaped like a W, are used in ovens. Here, a worker places a spring into a machine that makes its hooks. He uses an adapter to avoid hurting his fingers. He places each one individually because specs for springs can vary by minute amounts. This company makes some springs with hooks made of two rings instead of one. Clients order them this way because the hooks are more durable. Custom orders for springs can range from just a few to many thousand. This is another type of wire form. It'll be used in a firearm. A worker assembles it by hand because it's so intricate. After joining two base pieces, he places them into a small die. Using a foot pedal, he controls the die to bend the segments and complete the assembly. To check the compression spring's tension, a worker tests it with a weight gauge. 
The correct tension varies depending on what the client wants. A 3.8 centimeter long spring, for example, might need to withstand five pounds of tension when compressed to 2.5 centimeters. To test an extension spring, workers just add hooks to the weight gauge. Whether they're extension, compression, torsion, or wire form, and whether they're inside pens or satellites, springs prove that some old ideas definitely still work. Process of making it makes a difference. What else do you think might make a difference? The springs that we were just shown were done by bending the metal, not by heating it. That's true. Rebar's got got like a contour to it, so maybe some it's stress not concentration. Okay. Anything else? I say the grain, that like like on the material side, of like the grain is go. definitely different in the material. I think it's, yeah. like I said, it's kind of not a ductile material. It's very, seems like it'd be very brittle, high strength. Yeah. Okay. If it's that easy, wouldn't everybody do it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I would want to do it. But yeah, you guys guessed it. It turned out that it actually worked for a while. You drove it around. Uh, the springs kept getting lower and lower. So finally, you can see it going down and. And you know, as, as he continued to compress and expand them, oh, there, there was a good shot. You can see the length of the spring and how originally it was much longer. And they, they wore out very quickly. He ended up driving around, I think, five or 10 miles, something like that. I actually intended to put this in my list of videos for you to watch if you wish. I'll try to remember to do that later. Maybe I'll do that during the break. But uh, it didn't work out very well. And they didn't last very long. And one of the biggest problems was the material. Spring material is something that's very important. Uh, there are a few different materials that are commonly used, uh, and we'll refer to them by the names that they go by when they're used as springs, and that's music wire. And there is a particular alloy for music wire. I think your author mentions it. Uh, let's see, go to page 602. Oh, that's not it. Maybe 603. Here it is. ASTM A228 steel wire. So page 603. And by the way, while we're right here, page 602 and 603, these are charts you're going to refer to quite a bit. I would highly recommend you mark these pages. There's actually one more. It's on page 604. All those go together. Let me just mention this now because I'm going to mention it several times again. There is another set of pages that looks a lot like this that also needs to be marked, but it's a very different set of pages. It's pages 621 through 623. Compare the 603 page, for example, to page 621. You see how they look very similar? As a matter of fact, the lower figure on page 621, figure 1825, refers to music wire. Just as the first figure on page 603, page 189, refers to music wire. This is the same material. The charts look similar, and you can imagine that during the stress of exam, you might get confused between these two sets of charts. As I said, both sets need to be marked. However, the first set is for compression and extension springs. The second set, which begins on page 621, is for torsion springs. Now, you can write that in if you want, but your author has kindly 
written that on all of the charts. See on the charts where it says compression and extension springs on every single one of them? And then page 621, they all say torsion springs. You might just highlight that. Maybe in different colors, I don't know. You don't want to use the material data, which is what that is. I'll explain more about it a little later. You don't want to use that for the wrong type of spring because the stress in the spring is totally different. So the behavior of the material is different as well. There are other types that we'll use oil tempered to high carbon steel, 302 stainless. There's some nickel alloys that are in common use for springs as well for high, higher temperature applications. Um, I just referred to these pages, 602 through 604. Those are the pages we will go to for coil springs or compression and extension springs. Speaking of extension springs, you saw some extension springs made in the video. The key difference between the two, there's two key differences. Number one is that you have these end loops on an extension spring. It's very common. The, the number of end treatments is not, well, I guess it's only limited by your imagination. You do pretty much anything you want as long as you can bend the wire that way once it's already been made into a coil. Um, another key difference is that an extension spring usually has some preload. So what that means is it requires some non-zero force to even begin separating the coils. Does that make sense? On a compression spring, there's some coil clearance where you can compress the spring and, you know, if you have no uh, force on the spring, there will be no compression. The, the coil clearance will be at its maximum. But in the case of an extension spring, you have to apply some minimum force before any deflection occurs. Does that make sense? That's a key difference between the two. And designing that key load is some, or that, that, uh, that initial load is a key parameter. The interesting thing about it is that the free length, the end loops actually add to the free length. So that's another degree of freedom in the design that you can have in order to change the spring operating characteristics. There's still a length of body, there's still a number of loops. Uh, you can have all kinds of different types of, of hoops or hooks at the end, uh, ends of the spring, as I said, just limited by your imagination. But uh, basically, an extension spring is very much like a compression spring, except that you've got the preload and you've got the end. Torsion springs are different enough that I want to pause. It's only two more slides, but I want to pause here and I want to talk more about extension and compression springs. Before we do that, you guys are probably ready for a break. So go ahead and take a five minute break. When you come back, we'll probably watch another video and then we will go into uh, an example problem.